Well, my name's Dee Ellis. I'm a veterinarian, as I said, at Texas A&M, and thank you for the kind introduction earlier. Um, for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to try real briefly just to give you food for thought uh, related to zoonotic disease threats um, in the environment of the folks that are on this call. It, it's not my intention to make you diagnosticians, but there's some basics that if you just remember and understand, it'll go a long way about protecting yourself and your workers from uh, disease or pest threats that are associated with livestock and poultry ag workers. So let's get going here. So if you think about it as zoonotic disease, what does that mean? It just means it's a disease that either an animal can give to a human and humans can give diseases to animals and it happens all the time. And, and of course, the environmental component is the wild card that we're gonna talk about and what y'all uh, interact with on a daily basis. How can we catch a disease from an animal? Well, some of them are common sense and you're aware of them. Maybe some of these are just food for thought. Uh, vectors, uh, animal bites, bug bites, you can swallow it. You, it could be food, it could be water. Fecal contamination, inhalation, aerosol dust. These are both everyday uh, environmental challenges for folks working um, in ag sector. And um, your mucous membranes, if you'll just remember that your eyes, your nose, your mouth are, are pretty much open doors for bugs, germs to get into your body. And so any way that you can mitigate that potential, then you're going a long way towards protecting yourself. And then fomites deserve their own slide. And here it is. And maybe most of y'all know what this is, but fomite is just an inanimate object that where disease agents hang out. And I intentionally put a couple of different slides on here with dirty boots. Um, it's one of the easiest ways to track around uh, germs um, and also to introduce uh, the pathogens to places they shouldn't be. As well as you can see, there's a squeeze chute and, it, and, the, and the doorknob is kind of almost a joke, but that's, that's a very common fomite. But equipment, clothes, bedding, water. And, and one thing to keep in mind is organic material in general, such as manure, or straw or bedding hides viruses, bacteria, other organisms very well. They can persist inside that because it stays cool and moist and wet. And uh, uh, they like that. So that's probably one of the biggest things that can that is done when there's a biosecurity concern is cleaning and disinfecting. Half the, dis the disinfectant is obviously using chemicals, but the cleaning is just removing organic matter. Um, here, here's a basic principle. I probably should show this slide more than once because it's really all you need to remember on, on how diseases are spread. And if you can break this cycle in any one of these three components, um, it's how you can prevent uh, disease introduction, agent, host, and environment. And so um, the host would be us, right? Be a human. And uh, Agent could be the infectious material that we're worried about, whether it's a virus or bacteria. And then the environment, this is, this is where you can mitigate this. And this is what I'm assuming most of y'all um, uh, work in every day is, a, is, the, uh, is the environment where you can uh, clean, disinfect, you can protect yourselves, minimize dust, avoid runoff, lagoons, and all those kinds of things. And so you can have the agent you know, around, and you can even be a susceptible host, but if you properly mitigate the environment through good and best practices, then there's still not a disease transmission. And mainly just remember, this isn't an accident. You have to have all three of these things working together to actually transmit disease. And there's indirect transmission and direct transmission, and these are just terms for you to keep in mind and just reinforce the idea that you don't actually have to touch an animal that's sick to get the disease, you can uh, you know come in contact with their crates, uh, the bedding, the manure, as I've said, and then when it comes to indirect transmission, now we're talking about the doorknob, which is a fomite, dirty boots, or vectors such as mosquitoes or ticks. There's a number of different kinds of disease agents, and it's not important that you know much about them, other than I just want you to understand these are all living organisms in different ways, and they're all different sizes and have different characteristics. And when I'll just run through some of these for you. So you understand the, you know, you realize how common these are. Um, rabies is a common virus. E. coli is a bacteria. Fungi, it would be a ringworm, would be a good example of a fungal infection. And giardia is a protozoan. And, and how do you keep them uh, separate? And how do you understand all of these? Well, it takes a little time to practice. But one thing to keep in mind is they're very different. 
Um, they're not all the same. That means different disinfectants work, different measures would work, different environments are, are more or less risky for these. But here's one just to give you a visualization how small a virus is compared to a, uh, the protozoa, which are the largest of these four types of infectious agents. Just pretend here you're looking at Mount Everest as a protozoa, then a three foot child would be a virus, bacteria are bigger than a virus, and a fungi is in between a bacteria and uh, the protozoas. Here's an example of a transmission cycle, and this is actually relevant because it's going on right now, so I need to change this slide where it says the last outbreak was in 2015. This is a current event happening right now, and for those of y'all in the uh, poultry industry, you're very much aware of it. But this is not only an animal disease, but avian influenza and, and type A influenzas can also affect humans. And here's Here's just a little diagram of how this could happen. The, the virus is actually circulating all the time in wild birds, and it's the migratory wild birds that come all the way down from Canada, Alaska, come on down through the different flyways, such as the Pacific Flyway in the West and the Atlantic and Mississippi Flyways, and they bring these viruses with them. And a lot of these waterfowl are not that sick when they catch them, they're just transporting it. And uh, But when they come in contact with our uh, domestic birds and poultry uh, chickens and both uh, broilers and egg layer uh, uh, chickens as well as turkeys and other domestic birds. When the virus jumps species, oftentimes it, it changes in its pathogenicity and its ability to make animals sick. Humans are just another type of animal in this case and so we can catch it from the poultry litter, we can catch it from handling the birds or their eggs or their crates and this is a classic example of a zoonotic disease transmission. Uh, from animal to animal to humans. Here's just some examples of them different settings. And I just tried to put together some, some pictures that kind of resonate with, with y'all in the audience as to where you might uh, work or where you might interact with animals. And always just in the back of your mind, be thinking about disease transmission, not only for yourself, but your coworkers and your family, if that's appropriate. Um, concentrated animal operations, feedlots, dairies, poultry houses, swine facilities, Obviously, biosecurity is, is at the top of the list of important uh, policies and business uh, decisions made every day. But also in this context, remember, we're talking about you as well as the animals. Backyard chickens, um, uh, urban transitional backyard settings are some of the highest risk. One, because if you go to the commercial opera picture on the right, the folks there are probably a little more educated about biosafety and biosecurity, but backyard folks just wanted some chickens to lay eggs for their kids or recreation or fun or hobbies. You know, they're not as educated in something as simple as, um, you know, touching your hands to your mouth or your face or your ears uh, uh, can transmit these diseases. And for children, that's a huge risk. A livestock wildlife interface. This is a kind of a cool picture. It's just some zebras near cattle in Africa. And obviously here's a way that a disease can get from wildlife to domestic uh, animals and then onto their human uh, caretakers. There's more of the same there on the fair shows and exhibitions. Some of the most common ways that uh, zoonotic diseases are spread at times are live birthing exhibitions. And there's an entire protocol and setting now on the public health side that helps folks in, in uh, shows, fairs, exhibitions that want to do either a petting zoo or a live birthing exhibit, things they can do to mitigate the possibility of disease transmission, such as hand washing stations and educational information. Uh, provided uh, outside the, the pens. Here's, here's a few examples of some zoonotic disease threats. And again, I'm not trying to make any of you all uh, diagnosticians, but just give you some examples and a variety of ways um, that animals can give diseases or pests uh, to uh, humans. Rabies, everyone's heard of that. And it doesn't have to be a wild animal. It could be a, it could be a domestic animal, but that's a virus. Um, and it's spread by bites and saliva. And then brucellosis is a bacteria that uh, wild hogs, have, it's about in, uh, in, te in Texas, about 10% of the wild hogs have brucellosis or brucella suis. And in Yellowstone, there's a problem there with some of the elk and the bison in Yellowstone. We eradicated the abortus in our cattle population about uh, 15 years ago in the US. It used to be a problem and is really now why we still pasteurize our milk and milk products is to prevent the disease transmission of that. 
here's a couple of uh, here's a couple of pictures of uh, uh, pests, mange, or a mite infestation in swine, and then you would get this through direct contact with the animals or touching their bedding where the the mites might live. A couple of tick-borne diseases, Rocky Mountain spotted fever and Lyme, they affect humans. And uh, you know, I want to be sure and mention here that for any of these zoonotic considerations, including uh, Lyme and Rocky Mountain spotted fever, if you or your workers are sick and decide to go to a doctor, it is very important that you tell those folks that you work in the ag sector. Because if I just walked in tomorrow with a disease and I just said, well, I got a fever and a sore throat and a slight cough, et cetera, they're thinking the flu, they're thinking coronavirus, they're thinking the common cold. And those are some of the same symptoms you might get with, with some ag-related diseases. So it's always important to tell a human or a medical doctor that you work around animals and livestock and environmental conditions that are conducive to disease spread if you go to the doctor. E. coli, everyone's heard of that. And I think the pictures here are obviously um, pertinent to this audience and they live in contaminated water, feces, equipment, soil, chlamydia, avian chlamydiosis, another bacteria, aerosolized feces, contaminated water and feed and carcasses. And again, all of these are why, you know, the personal protective equipment is what it is when you start to protect yourself from diseases. And finally, a couple more just for reference, different kinds of transmission potentialities. Salmonella is a, and, and pigs and, and the commercial swine uh, salmonellosis looks very similar to some foreign animal diseases, actually some that could be caused by a virus or other, other things. And so salmonella is a common disease of animals. And obviously, as y'all know, humans can catch it as well. There's a number of varieties of salmonella and then giardia, also known as beaver fever. If you go camping in the mountains, can persist in contaminated soil and water. Um, and that's a protozoa. So we'll, we'll talk here as I wrap up my talk a couple of common terms that get misunderstood, and I want to give an example of each of those. Um, biosafety and biosecurity, and, if not, and put them together, and there's your integrated risk management. For those of y'all that are um, the supervisors on this call, you're very familiar with that. And if you're just a, a worker that's performing these activities, just think of it this way. Biosafety is a, a precautionary measures you take to protect yourself, and biosecurity are the things you do to keep from spreading disease. And I have a slide on each of these. So here you go. Biosafety measures are taken by an individual to pretend, prevent the introduction of the harmful organisms to themselves. And like I said, hand washing, protective equipment, et cetera, not touching your eyes and mouth are huge for that. Biosecurity are the kinds of things you and your coworkers do to prevent the transmission of the disease from your farm or your ag setting to another farm or another ag setting. And this is huge. Any of y'all are in commercial poultry right now, you're worried about um, avian influenza. If you're in the commercial swine industry, you're worried about PERS and, and other different infectious diseases um, of swine. And so this is a huge part of your life every day if you work in those two settings. As we wrap up here, here's just some things to consider. And again, not sure of whether y'all are in management or you're on the ground working, but employee education, um, if you're in management, make sure your, your employees are understand this, you know, take my presentation and give it to them for more than 15 minutes. Obviously they need to understand the risks, how to mitigate the risks. And then you need make sure they have the right equipment to protect themselves. And then are they using that equipment? Um, that's important part of that. If you're uh, worried about biosecurity, again, just always keep in mind the one health concept. That's the, that's the main thing in my talk is that these organisms and vectors can transmit back and forth between humans and animals and they can persist in the environment. And that's the buzzword that's growing in uh, uh, importance every day now in the, in the, around the world um, for disease risk mitigation procedures. Your employees need to practice. They need to practice, practice, practice. You know, some things as simple as if you've got disease on a farm, well, you go to your healthy animals first and then you go to the dirty animals second. If we're talking about a lagoon or some kind of runoff or some kind of a disposal equipment, that's always dirty, you know? So I'll keep that in mind if you're dealing with animals and environmental um, hazards. Um, changing clothes, footwear, some really common sense things. But again, from a management perspective, 
Do you have policies? Are your people educated about those policies? Are they following those policies? And that should actually be part of their job performance and reward them if they're doing a great job. And if they're not, you know, try and re-educate them. Uh, so again, I didn't want to try and make this too complicated, but just remember the, the host, the agent, and the environment. Y'all are working in the environment every day. And if you take a good a care of your problems there, um, it'll mitigate the, the risk to your uh your host or your own employees, regardless of the agent. I'll stop there and turn it back over. Um.